Hello, welcome to the channel. My name is Chris. I'm a real world fast jet flying instructor with experience in turboprop and fast jet aircraft, as well as British and American airframes. So plenty of experience. And I'm going to bring that experience to you today in this all encompassing video that will teach you to land any fast jet. And that's pretty darn bold. And I'll tell you how we're going to do that in just a second. But this video will be interesting to you if you're just, uh, well, interested in military aviation. You want to see behind the scenes on what real world pilots do and consider in cockpit to make their approaches consistent and accurate. But even better, if you've got your own simulator and any, well, it can be any simulator, not just this one, which is Microsoft Flight Sim, but any sim, any fast jet, and the techniques I teach you here will enable you to make your approaches and landings much better. I will teach you four fundamentals and I'll involve chapters in the description so you can skip ahead if you wish. Uh, but I recommend sticking with it and watching each one because each fundamental leads on to the next one and the result is that you have a nice stable approach. I'll be following up in two different aircraft. So this is the Hawk T1 that doesn't have head up display. It doesn't use alpha for the approach and it uses two different flap settings. And then I'll do the same approach in the F-18, which does have a head up display. It has a flight path marker. It has full flap only generally in the way I'm going to fly it. And the landing technique is different as well. And it's much simpler to fly the F-18 than it is the Hawk. And I'll talk to why that is when I jump in the F-18. So fundamental number one is going to be being on speed. Now, where are you going to find the speeds is the question. Now, you can look in the manual for your model if you're using a flight sim, but you can Google or use any other search engine uh, the aircrew manual or the pilot operating handbook or whatever you want. You can Google it and I'll put a link in the description below and you can use the real world flight manual for this aircraft type, which is pretty neat. And in there, it will suggest that you can cruise around at 300 knots. When you're in the radar pattern or positioning for a straight in, about 230 knots is you go to. Once you configure with the fuel weight that we're at, and we're about 600 kilos here, uh, we want 150 knots with mid flap and gear down. Down the approach, we want to end up at about 130 knots at short final with full flap. And then over the threshold, we want 110 knots plus one knot for every 100 kilos. So in this case, with 600 kilos, our threshold speed is going to be 116 knots. A lot of information there. I recommend if you've got a favorite fast jet, you take the time just to find out what those speeds are so that you can fly accurately. And even better, find out what the pitch and power settings are associated with each one. And then you'll be able to quickly manage and quickly get in trim and let the aircraft do the, the hard work for you. So I find this model requires a little bit extra power than what is uh, stated in the real manuals, but you'll get an idea. Just set something uh, roughly sensible and then adjust as required really so we've got about 80% set 230 knots is working out a treat so that is being on speed and we'll come back to speeds more in a little bit the second fundamental is being on glide slope and that's not just being on glide slope but finding your way there when do I want to start descending and where is the point in the sky that I want to descend from so the way I've done it here well there's two different ways one because it's an airfield I'm very familiar with I know this forest is a good lineup feature for the runway 31 but I've also got 21 X-ray, which is the TACAN set down uh, here. And I've got the course bar on roughly 310, which is the runway orientation. And you can see the course deviation index is coming into the center, which means I'm approaching the extended center line of runway 31. So there we go, navigation complete. Then we need to find out what our top of descent is. But first of all, let's configure the aircraft. So I'm not following the real world procedures and checklists. I'll roughly make sure I'm below 200 knots, which is a decent place to be. I've calculated my threshold speed of 116, below 200 knots, air brake in, light out, gear and flaps to mid. Nice. Uh, remember to lower the nose slightly because the flap will make you increase your altitude with the extra lift. And then anticipate the 150 knots by setting about 90% RPM. And then pitch and power and trim, make sure the aircraft flies itself as best as possible. Three greens and flaps indicate to mid. Cool, I'm going to pause it here. I'll use active pause, hopefully the parameters won't wander too much, and talk about when the top of descent is. So fast jets usually like a two and a half to three degree glide path. Now for a three degree glide path, you will lose 300 feet for every nautical mile that you travel. For a 2.5 degree glide path, you'll lose 250 feet for every nautical mile travel. So that's really useful information for finding where we want to descend. Now I've got the QNH set, but my airfield is roughly sea level, so I'm not too worried about elevation versus above mean sea level. 
So with my settings here on the altimeter, I know that I'm 1500 feet above threshold. So if I'm on a three degree, that's 300 feet per, min, uh, per nautical mile, 1500 feet divided by 300 gives me five. So five nautical miles, and I'm using the Takan range here, five nautical miles is when I want to descend for a three degree glide path. If I use two and a half, that's 250 feet per nautical mile, then 1500 feet divided by 250 gives me six. So if I want a two and a half degree glide path, I'll start descending at six miles. Now remember, my Takan isn't based on the threshold, so I'm probably a little bit closer to the airfield threshold than uh, my range suggests, but it's a means to an end, and we'll pick it up visually once we get closer. I'll put all of that in the description below so you can see the uh, calculation that I did so that you can do it yourself. Okay, so we are here, we are configured, now we know when to descend. Next we need to know is how quickly to descend because we don't have a flight path marker. So we need a rate of descent and that's all based on ground speed. So given that the fact the wind is light, I'm gonna assume that my 150 knots indicated is my ground speed. Now the formula for this is 150 because that's my speed divided by two gives me 75 divided uh, times by 10 gives me 750 add 50 gives me 800 feet a minute. If I want a two and a half degree glide path, then I'll do the same maths, but not the extra 50. So 150 divided by two, 75, 750, when I times it by 10, so 750 feet rate of descent. That is what I want to do in terms of the rate of descent. So now I know when to descend and I know how quickly to descend. The next is actually the mechanics of putting the aircraft on those parameters. So I've got 90% set, I'm holding 150 knots very stably, I'm coming up towards five miles and we're gonna start descending. Unlike the F-18, when I descend, rather than move the throttle, I'm gonna move the flaps. And that will keep my speed stable as I descend. So there's five miles, flaps go down, lower the nose, the attitude about one about on the horizon, actually on the attitude indicator. Trim it, flaps indicate down, the Feet per minute is about 900 there, so not bad. I'll hold it, I'll trim it, the speed is stable, and we're on our way down. Simple as that. Small pitch and power changes, keeping it in trim. Next on the glide path, we can calculate or work it out as we go. So 300 feet times three miles, I should be at 900 feet when I get to three miles on my Takan range. So we're now 1100 feet. We're almost at three miles, so let's see how we do in terms of our, our altitude here. Three miles, now 910 feet, happy with the rate of descent. And now we're visual, we can continue visually using the pappies and just the aspect of the runway. So pappies, two reds, two whites, and you can see what the runway looks like at this point. Now I'm gonna power back a little bit, maybe 85%, and just allow that speed to trickle back. I'll trim back as well, because I'll need to pitch up and maintain the glide path. And I'm aiming for 130 knots, short final. So fundamental number three is my aim point. And I'll pause it just here using the normal pause so I'm not changing my parameters. And you can see this is where the threshold is. That is my aim point. If I'm doing an ILS, which I'm not teaching today because that's a bit cheating, you'd be pointing at the pappies and you'd be aiming to land at the pappies unless you pick up visual earlier. I digress, more on that in another video. But we want to aim at the threshold and certainly within the first thousand feet of the threshold. So in order to achieve that, we need to find out a way of pointing our aircraft exactly at the threshold. If you're pointing at something, it's not going to be moving up in the canopy and it's not going to be moving down in the canopy, all things being equal. It's just the bit that gets bigger without moving up or down. So if you notice that the threshold is going down in your field of view, that means you're going too high. And if it's going up in your field of view, it means you're going too low. And that's what I'll use as my perception to try and maintain the glide path. I know that my pappies are going to go from two reds, two whites to four reds because I'm aiming to land before them. So that is how I'm judging my aim point. So here we go. The final point of uh, the final fundamental, the fourth fundamental is how to actually flare the aircraft. And this one, I'm going to flare off the aircraft completely, which means I'm going to raise the nose and fly down the runway at level so that the wheels touch down very smoothly. So here we are looking for 116 knots. That's 120 aiming at the threshold, speed's good, looking to the end of the runway, I'll raise the nose, I'll power back, and I'll hold the aircraft off a little bit, hold it off, I know I'm slightly right at the center line, but that's fine. And I'm gonna push the nose forwards, nose is down, put on the brakes, and then pull back on the stick. 
But other than, my, other than me wandering slightly right at the center line, which is easy to fix next time around, you see the method of flaring the aircraft off so you get a nice smooth touchdown. Now, if you find yourself landing long, it generally means you're too fast. And if you're landing in the underrun, you're generally too slow. So remember, try and calculate that nice accurate approach speed so that you've got the right performance on the aircraft when it comes to the flare. Uh, so that is the Hawk T1. Let's jump in the F-18 now. I'll show you how much easier it is in that aeroplane. Okay, and here we are in the mighty F-18. It's got the Maverick colors and everything. It looks amazing, and we're gonna show you how easy it is to land this aircraft from a straight-in approach. Uh, so if you've not already watched the Hawk T1, I certainly recommend checking that out because some of the techniques useful there will be useful in this aircraft should you wish to use them. I'll also demonstrate how the calculations that we performed in the Hawk work out given the extra bells and whistles that we have in cockpit of the MFDs and the head-up display. So here we are downwind for RAF Valley, and we'll talk through a little bit of navigation first, just so I know how to find my way to the straight in approach point, which is over here on this forest. That's the visual point I'm aiming for. But if you want to navigate there using the systems, the easy way of doing it is to set the TACAN. So TACAN on the UFCP here, TCN. It's not on until you hit T and R, and then you see it's on, and you'll need to find the HSI on the MFD. And to find that, you select the lower middle button, the HSI on the left, and you can see there's now an arrow pointing back and right, which is where my airfield is. Top left, you'll see the bearing and the range. We're currently 3.2, 3.3 miles from the airfield. So there's the TACAN working for us. If you find when you dial in 21 and press enter, it goes to 21 Yankee. If you click the 21 Yankee, it will change back to 21 X-ray. And CNI gets you back to the main page. Now I'm going to set myself my squawk. Enter. There we go. 4577. There's the navigation taken care of. So first fundamental we talked about in the F in the Hawk, sorry, is to be on speed. Now you can do the same thing as you can with the Hawk, and that's Google or search for the real documents that pertain to flying this aircraft. They're called NATOPS. It's the pilot operation handbook, the aircrew manual, whatever you want to call it. You can actually find the real world stuff to read through. And to summarize, the reference speed is 125 plus two and a half knots for every thousand pounds of fuel and or underwing stores as your final approach speed. And the final approach speed, the speeds we're using is based on full flap and we're not using mid flap. I don't even know if it has it. I don't think it does. But that's a lot of calculating to do, which you might not want to. So the simple way of doing it is to configure the aircraft. And I recommend just be below 200 knots because that's good enough for this aircraft. Certainly the sim anyway. Below 200 knots, configure the aircraft, and then slow to 130 knots and see if that relates to a decent alpha. Now, this aircraft flies alpha on approach, and you get different symbology in the head-up display to show you when you're on alpha. The speed will change slightly depending on how heavy you are. If you're heavyweight, you'll be higher speed to maintain all the alpha, but the alpha will be roughly the same, and so will the symbology in the head-up display. So we'll talk more of that when we get to our straight-in positions. So that's fundamental one, being on speed. Second is being on glide path, so when to descend and how quickly descend to descend. And that's so easy in the F-18, it's unreal. So the TACAN you can see is now off to our right 9 o'clock. That's uh, right 9 o'clock, right 3 o'clock, you know what I mean, is over there. As we head west, the tail end of the needle is going to move with us. We're pulling the tail end of the needle, and the head of the needle will turn right and head towards 310. So whilst we don't have a course deviation index like we did in the Hawk, we can still use roughly the same techniques to get that needle pointing at 310 so that we're facing up and pointing back in towards the airfield. I'll put myself down at 1500 feet like I did in the Hawk just to demonstrate the fact that calculations were accurate and they work the same regardless of using a HUD or not. So here we go, below 200 knots, 1500 feet ish. Let's go gear, flap all the way down. Nice. And I'm slowing down to 130 knots. Once I see the airfield, I'll uh, orientate myself a little bit better. I think I'm slightly right of center line, but that'll do. So now you can see this E on the left hand side of the flight path marker. So let's pause it. Uh, let's active pause it here. Is that going to work? No, let's do a solid pause. There we go. Normal pause. So in the head-up display, we have the flight path marker, which is the circle with the three lines coming out, and that is the vector of your airplane. So that's the horizon line. If you put the flight path marker on the horizon, you're not climbing, you're not descending, you are level. 
On the left hand side, now that we've configured, we have the E, also affectionately known as the staple. And that is your alpha indication with the gear down. So if the flight path marker, or if the E is next to the flight path marker and the flight path marker is in the middle, that means you're on alpha, as long as you're stable, wings level, and accelerated, all that good stuff. So I'm not quite there here, but for demonstration purposes, your flight path marker should be here in relation to the staple. If you vary your speed or your pitch, you'll change the alpha and that E will go up and down quite crazily. So if try and find the speed and fly the speed rather than fly the flight path marker to the staple. I'll demonstrate that more in a moment. On the right hand side, you can see a triangle. This triangle relates to your excess power. And if you put the power on and accelerate, that triangle goes above the flight path marker. If it's below, like it is here, you'll be slowing down because you've got insufficient power. So you can use that as well. Once you've found the speed that you want is change the power until that is next to your flight path marker and then your speed stable. So we've got on speed, on alpha, and then we're ready for uh, when to descend. So here we go. Let's unpause it and try and get ourselves onto parameters a bit better. Here we go. I said 130, but actually it looks more like 125, maybe 120 knots. Make sure you trim the aircraft out. Very pitch stable, definitely worth trimming. Trim, 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 trim. Lots more trimming. You never trim enough. 120, there we go. You can see the triangle stable on the right hand side, the staple is stable on the left hand side. If I pitch up and down, it's really hard to follow that staple, so try not to chase it. Likewise, if you go too slow, that staple, if you try and stay level, will go low. So you see I'm 110 knots, and the staple is gone. If I go too fast, the staple goes high. Remember, find the speed, adjust ever so slightly, make sure you're in trim. 120 knots, here we go. So the speeds might not be quite accurate per the NATOPS, but we're good enough. We've achieved what we want to. Now we need to descend on a two and a half degree glide path. You can see the threshold is just slightly right of the nose, it's here. And I want to put the flight path marker on it. Let's pause it here and have a look at what we've got. So we've got a five degree pitch ladder here. Sometimes when you configure on some aircraft, you'll have a two and a half degree just to help you find that two and a half degree glide path, should you wish. But here we can see the threshold. I know I'm slightly off, it doesn't matter. Uh, the threshold is around about the three degree line, if there was a three degree line. Okay, so I know that the threshold is on a three degree glide path from where my airplane is. Now, if I put my flight path marker on the threshold, once I've lined up properly, I will then keep my three degree glide path all the way down. And it's as simple as that. Now remember in the Hawk, we said that uh, with a three degree glide path, we want about five miles. Now we've started our descent and you can see the range is 4.8. So the five miles is an accurate calculation. So let's carry on down and see how we maintain this. If I was to level off, and remember when you pitch, when you change pitch with full flap, you need to change the power as well. If I maintain level, that threshold will start going under the nose if I put my flight path marker back on the threshold, you'll notice that it's roughly at the four degree point or where the four degree line would be on the head up display. So if you are steep, then you need to go steeper in order to fix it. So I'll put the nose down to about six or seven degrees. Power is required to keep my speed stable and therefore my staple stable. And you can slowly watch that threshold go up in the pitch ladder until it gets to about three degrees, at which point you can reset your flight path marker on the threshold and you should be back on glide path. So that's the glide path, that's fundamental two. Fundamental three in this aeroplane, and like with the Hawk, is gonna be the aim point. The aim point's pretty much taken care of itself because we've got a flight path marker. And where you point the flight path marker is where you're going to land slash impact if you don't do anything about it. Now I find that if you were to land with a flight path marker on the threshold, you'll actually land a little bit short. So I employ a little bit of a check before landing to just shift my aim point ever so slightly. So fundamental four is flaring this airplane and in some cases you don't, I carry a landings. In this one, I'm gonna do a check, kick, close. So check the nose up, kick off any drift and then close the throttle. So my aim point is stable, the glide path maybe about three and a half. Keep it stable, keep it stable. There we go, on the threshold. They're so approaching thousand feet out. I'm gonna check, kick, close. Rate of descent is about 500 feet, I'm down. Nose comes down, brake, and then back stick to slow down. There is a controlled impact on the runway, and I haven't followed perfect F-18 procedures, so don't call me out too much about it. 
Um, but it's so easy to land because you don't have to flare that much. You just let it hit the ground, but you should be on alpha when you do so. Now I produced another video to show you how to do this, and that's the nose wheel steering, because of course, once you land, you want to be able to use the rudder pedals to steer. And I'll put a link to that above uh, so that you can have a look at how to engage the nose wheel steering. But that is approach and landing in the F-18, pretty darn simple based on the fact you have a HUD, you have a flight path marker, and you fly alpha all the way down. But absolutely critical is being on speed, on alpha, and in trim. Uh, but I hope that video is useful to you. If you're still watching, thanks very much for doing so. Please chuck in a like, even better, subscribe, and a notification bell, uh, and then you won't miss out on future videos. And let me know which of these techniques you're going to use and which have worked for you, because it's really interesting to hear if it's been helpful at all. But that's it from me. I hope you'll join me for the next video, but until the next time, take care.